Coming up on Market to Market, world leaders stare down global climate change in the city of lights. An agricultural giant looks to reduce its carbon footprint and the new frontier for genetically modified organisms. Those stories and market analysis with Naomi Bloom, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, December 4 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Mike Pearson is away this week. Strong job growth and steady unemployment were counterbalanced by an oil glut and a record high dollar. According to the Labor Department, the unemployment rate held steady at 5% for the second month in a row. However, a litany of troubling economic news earlier in the week confirmed what the Creighton University nine-state business conditions index revealed earlier this week with another below-growth neutral report. This was coupled with crude oil prices that fell below $40 as OPEC kept the taps open despite oversupply. Even with lower energy prices, the dollar index climbed over 100 this week, the first time in 13 years, making U.S. goods a little more expensive. The news bolstered Federal Reserve Board's faith in the U.S. economy, making an interest rate hike a near certainty. Bumping interest rates higher may be the least of the worries for rural America. In what appears to be good news, Congress restored $3 billion in crop insurance funds cut from a recent budget deal. However, Peter will pay Paul with an increase to the federal gas tax. Ethanol, which supporters say cut fuel prices and greenhouse gases, had its production requirements cut by the EPA this week. The final ruling put production numbers squarely between oil company wishes and the 2016 federal mandate. Cutting greenhouse gas emissions was at the top of the list for world leaders who met in the City of Lights this week. The assembled politicians have already started hammering out the details. The goal for world leaders is mammoth in Paris, sweeping global agreement to cut carbon emissions, all to be negotiated in the next two weeks. Following many photo ops this week, the talks between 150 countries carried a harried tone. I believe in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. that there is such a thing as being too late. And when it comes to climate change, that hour is almost upon us. Several countries in the room have already pledged steps to curb heat trapping pollution, hoping to cap the rise in Earth's average temperature this century to two degrees Celsius. On this vote, the yeas are 243, the nays are 181. The resolution is adopted. The talks were met with skepticism, including on the floor of the United States House of Representatives. Republicans moved to block President Obama's plan to force steep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions from U.S. power plants. The Senate passed similar measures last month under a little-used law that allows Congress to block executive actions it considers onerous. Obama is expected to veto the bills and keep on his course of a 28% reduction below 2005 levels by 2025. Opponents to the president's plan say they are weighing costs and job ramifications. The House is taking up these measures and is doing so to reflect the will of the people that so many of us represent who are opposed to the administration's actions and wish to stop the out-of-control Environmental Protection Agency from doing further damage to the economy. The vote comes at nearly the same moment the president met with several world leaders, including China's Xi Jinping. China, the world's leader in greenhouse gas production, has started taking aggressive action to curb discharges with a pledge to slash 60 percent of 2005 emissions by 2030. India's prime minister continued his claim the problem isn't solely the fault of the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases. We have to ensure in the spirit of climate justice that the life of a few does not crowd 
out the opportunities for the many still on the initial steps of the development ladder. Leaders of France, Germany and Canada were among those in Paris this week. The three politicians say the smartest way to fight global warming is putting a price on carbon dioxide pollution. They recommend using a tax on emissions or putting a price on carbon and trading the gas like oil. There are already 40 countries around the world that impose a carbon tax on their citizens. Monsanto announced plans to make its operations carbon neutral by 2021. The agricultural giant says they'll work with farmers to reduce discharges through stricter emission controls, office energy use reductions, conservation tillage, and use of cover crops. As the discussions of climate change continue, the United Nations Environment Program says global warming is almost certainly responsible for the decrease in extent and thickness of Arctic sea ice. According to the Colorado-based Snow and Ice Data Center, last year's maximum Arctic sea ice extent was the smallest on record. Dramatic weather swings due to global climate change may shift where food is grown in the future. Just the growth of food is being complicated by herbicide-resistant weeds. The EPA recently withdrew approval of Endless Duo, a new weapon in the fight against superweeds found in fields planted with genetically modified seeds. The federal government remains the gatekeeper for GMOs and their support products. Now, two weeks ago, the FDA gave the nod to genetically engineered salmon. And in this report, producer Colleen Bradford Kranz examines what's ahead on the new frontier in genetically modified organisms. The federal government's recent approval of genetically modified salmon is raising questions among consumers and scientists about what other biological innovations might end up on Americans' dinner tables. The first genetically engineered produce, the Flavor Saver Tomato, was approved for human consumption 21 years ago by the Food and Drug Administration, less than three years after it was entered for consideration. The Aqua Advantage salmon, which the FDA decided in mid-November was safe for the environment, became the first genetically engineered animal approved for human consumption. Perhaps one day we will be eating genetically engineered animals, and therefore, if this technology is useful to solve a problem, we can use this technology to solve a problem. Some have applauded the methodical process through which the FDA considered Aqua Bounty's request to sell the salmon. However, University of Missouri professor and genetic engineering expert Kevin Wells believes the Massachusetts-based company's two-decade wait for a decision frightened away many would-be biotech scientists. It took so long that most of us began to, to have the opinion that nothing was ever going to get approved, that the United States was not going to approve any genetically engineered animals, and as a result, no other country would either. So most of us began to find it irresponsible to even train new students in this area. We are missing a generation of scientists because of this delay. Wells, who was on the Federal Veterinary Medicine Advisory Committee that examined Aquabounty's application, believes the government's decision took so long that the company's original patents will have expired long before the fish reaches grocery store freezers. The U.S. stamp of approval carries significant weight internationally, and numerous companies are waiting for the federal nod to release genetically modified animals. The FDA denied Market to Market's Freedom of Information Act request, seeking an accounting of how many genetically engineered animal projects have been submitted for approval and how long those projects have been waiting for a governmental yay or nay. Market to Market has appealed the FDA's decision. According to Aqua Bounty officials, their Atlantic salmon have been genetically modified with genes from Chinook salmon and from the eel-like ocean pout so that they will reach market size twice as quickly as their conventional counterparts. One of the company's goals with the new genetic line is to reduce fishing pressure on wild species. The fish, all sterile females, are slated to be raised at land-based facilities in Panama and Canada.
for approval, the sponsor has to demonstrate three things if it's for a food producing animal, that the GE change is safe to the animal, that the resulting food is safe for humans or animals, and then um, is it effective? Does the, does the GE material do what the sponsor claims it will? Many Americans remain leery of genetically modified foods, and those on either side of the issue are voicing frustration with the government's regulatory process. In response, the White House in July 2015 directed the various agencies dealing with biotechnology-related food products to improve the process in terms of clarity, transparency, and efficiency. The current complexity of the array of regulations and guidance documents developed under the 1986-1992 framework over the years can make it unduly difficult for firms with new products to navigate the process, while also making it difficult for the public to understand how that process works and to have confidence in the results. Government leaders, scientists, and consumer group representatives agreed during an FDA-sponsored public engagement session in October that officials must ensure a more efficient process without neglecting safety. While too much regulatory oversight will stifle promising innovations just as they are gaining momentum and market competitiveness, too little oversight will result in the public rejecting technology due to a lack of understanding and trust. Regulations must be developed that fully regulate engineered foods and organisms for all types of risks, including long-term food safety risks and indirect environmental harm, which are currently um, inadequately regulated. Several commented that dividing applications for new biotech products among the FDA, EPA, and USDA is inefficient, and that a single agency should employ specialized scientists to more effectively scrutinize each project. As the scale, complexity, and importance of biological technologies increases, is it essential that we build the infrastructure that helps everyone better understand biotechnology, its benefits, its risks, and its policies and practices? Over the last five years, I've experienced the frustration of practitioners and regulators alike who are trying to understand how they can better navigate and help evolve the systems to assess risks and benefits. Kelly Drinkwater, a representative of the nonprofit agency iGEM, which is dedicated to the advancement of synthetic biology, encouraged the government to continue its early consultations with those developing genetically engineered food products. The most effective safety interventions with teams are not through paperwork, but through early email exchanges as they're brainstorming their ideas. Early and informal has been the key, even when the project is entirely hypothetical. Tim Schwab, a research scientist from the environmental activist group Food and Water Watch, asked government officials to make plans for continued observation of new genetic lines after they are approved. FDA should also do comprehensive post-market surveillance, a process that should include labeling of foods containing GMOs. Dr. Nita Fedorov, a molecular biologist and National Medal of Science recipient, said new tools have simplified genetic modification creating opportunities to head off agricultural problems that may result from climate change. That provide unprecedented control over what genes are modified and how, something that has never been possible in the entire history of agriculture. Far from the halls of government, even those who work with the animals that might someday be genetically modified to be healthier or faster growing are cautious in their optimism. The only reservation I have is we do not know uh, what effects we're having on evolution. In other words, there is no guarantee going forward what modifying animals and plants will do. The science says it's safe. I believe it's safe. But there isn't a guarantee with the test of time like we've had with evolution uh, to get to this point. So. So I guess I'm in favor of it with, uh, with some reservation. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. South American crop projections and exports to China help move the grain markets higher. 
March wheat gained six cents and the nearby corn contract rose 14 cents. Informa projections for a slightly larger soybean crop failed to dampen spirits as the January contract moved 33 cents higher. January meal joined the party and rose $1.10 per ton. In the softs, March cotton gained 78 cents per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, the January Class 3 milk futures lost 11 cents. The livestock sector was mixed as the February cattle contract lost 460. January feeders fell 658 and the February lean hog contract gained $1.42. Now, in the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index lost 1.7 percent. December crude dropped $1.80 per barrel. Comex gold gained $27.90 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs commodity index lost more than six points to settle at 331.80. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Naomi Bloom. Naomi, welcome back. Thanks, Paul. All right, so we got to start with this dollar. I mean, 13-year yeah. high, mm -hmm. but yet... The commodities have come with it. That's normally not the case. Why is there a difference there? Yeah, the dollar had been working higher, of course, over the past few months. And, and normally when we see that, of course, it keeps the, the commodity prices lower in general. What's happening right now is more that the funds are taking their profits into year end. So they are short covering. And they have to put it on the books that they had a profitable year. So that's why we're seeing the market go higher. It's, it's not anything specifically to do with the dollar itself right now, but just that short covering. So this is a great opportunity for people to get caught up on cash sales. Well, you make it sound like the traders are looking good for Santa Claus or something Absolutely. like that. They're on their best behavior. So mm -hmm. what about in the wheat market? What's driving that one right now? Yeah, the wheat market had a, a really mixed uh, trading week this week. And the biggest thing was that we had heard from Argentina that they were going to reduce their export tax rate. It was going to go from 23% down to nothing. So the market was really nervous that we were going to get flooded with supply of wheat. Um, that probably won't be the case because Argentina's currency is really high, just like the dollar. So even though the export tax is, is down and it does provide incentive, it's not anything that's going to make it become the hottest game in town. The other thing with the wheat market right now, we're going to probably see that market stay in a range where the Chicago futures stay between 450 Five dollars at the most for the next month and there's some weather hit problems starting to occur like in India and Australia. India is actually going to be importing wheat because of the drought that's there but as far as the crop here in the United States it's looking really good 55 percent good to excellent and then the Russian crop is doing just fine. Some things starting to pick up with the Ukraine crop but otherwise uh, we still have a lot of supply to work through around the world. So if you're sitting with supply and you're waiting for five dollars that wait might be long or maybe you just take it now and move on. Fundamentally, we don't have any reason to have it go higher. So if the funds are short covering, this is your Christmas gift. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's talk about corn. Off 14 for the week on the nearby contract. Not above that $4 level. Again, I'll ask, is that something that could happen? Um, it's going <laughs> to take some probably weather issues down the road to get that to happen. So it's possible but we need the news to make it happen. The only thing that really happened news-wise this week was the EPA announcements. We're going to be blending 14.5 billion gallons of ethanol. And when you equate that to how much corn usage it is, it's, you know, magically exactly what the USDA had to say. It's 5.2 uh, billion bushels worth of corn. So it's not new news, but it's supportive news that even though our exports are suffering because the dollar is higher, at least we have constant demand from ethanol and we've got constant demand from the livestock market too. So going forward, any short covering rally we see into year end is definitely something to be using as an opportunity to make cash sales because it would take a serious weather situation here in the United States in order to get the market to really have anything to do with going above $4 future price. Because we're still sitting on a huge crop in the bins. We are still sitting on a huge crop. <laughs> so if you've got yeah. somebody holding some of that crop, is it time to buy that bin for next year or buy some type of uh, way for them to get rid of some of this crop? How are they going to, what's some advice going long term? Um, I would say this, um, for what you have in the bin, look at the basis contracts right now because the end user needs your product. They are begging for it. So lock in the basis contracts and probably over the next two to three weeks, the futures market will bounce up high enough that you can at least make some sort of a sale. Now going forward for new crop, what you haven't even planted yet for next spring, you're going to seasonally have your opportunity. Usually it's between Christmas and New Year's when everybody else is snoozing. 
that's the best time for pricing to happen. And so you're going to want to do some sort of a cash sale with that, um, depending on your comfort zone, if you would use like a futures contract or um, hedge to arrive, something like that, or just lock in the final forward contracted sale. There's opportunity there and make sure you capitalize on it. And the case can be made the same in soybeans a little bit because, you know, you talk about that year end. Sometimes people need to make some money to pay some of those bills. Another 33 cent rally on the week, uh, sell signal from a lot of different people. Is that something you think is going to keep going? I think that it was really fantastic that it was able to finish above $9 today. And now the next hurdle above it would be 925 And that's probably where it's going to run out of steam. That'll hit some of the old highs that we had a few months back. Fundamentally, we have no reason to get it to go through 925 at all. So again, here is your window of opportunity. It's not the big profits anyone was hoping for, but it's better than where it was, you know, just from a few weeks back. And we're not that far removed from that crop. Yeah, exactly. And, and that brings us to a question uh, via Twitter. We're, we're always thankful for the people that do tweet at us at Market to Market, or you can also go onto our Facebook page at IPTV Market. This one comes from Derek in Silver Lake, Kansas. He wants to know can soybeans rally to 950 or above without a weather problem in the next six months? So you're saying 925 is hard. He's throwing in a weather factor of that. Yeah. Where do you see? So, okay, so 925 is the short term target. If it goes through 925, it would bl blow through 950, and then it could go to $10 just from the technical perspective of it, but it is gonna take serious weather in South America and here to get that to happen because the supplies not only in the US but around the world are so big right now. And and it's it's the demand is there, the demand is constant. That's not the issue, it's just that we have a burdensome supply right now. So 925 is your target, but if the weather gets bad, yeah, there's upside. All right. Well, if you tweet it at us at Naomi or the show, we'll answer the rest of those in Market Plus, which you can find on our website as well, as well as that podcast. So uh, when we have you on, we like to talk dairy. Yeah. What's happening in the parlor? Oh, it's been a doom and gloom price. <laughs> oh, that's not very cheer. I, I know. you got to bring good cheer. I, well, the cheer is that I think it's done going down. So 1450 was a recent uh, price target that we had, and, and it's a big support area. On the production side, pr production is finally stabilizing. We had huge production for the longest time, but now we're not seeing the increase. The most recent milk production report only had a 0.1% increase, which is finally like, oh, okay, things are stabilizing. Um, the export front, again, because of the dollar is being, that's why the market price is, is so low. Um, our powder price was the lowest it's been since 2009, and that's the only market that the exports have actually been up. They're up almost 50% because the product is so cheap that it offsets how high the dollar is. And that's all going to China. But otherwise, the butter price here at home is high. Our cheddar prices here at home are still 25, 25 cents over the world prices right now. So we're not seeing that export product move. The, the domestic demand is good, but it's again, it goes back to the exports. So the milk price, I think the lowest end, but for the next month or two, probably stay between $14.50 and $15, and then we'll see how we can use up the supply that we have on hand. Well, is this the time of year? I mean, all those meat and cheese trays that people have uh, for the holidays, is that one of those that we talk about in the yeah. grilling season? Is that yeah. the same thing Well, with that's dairy? the hope. Normally that happens, that during the holidays, you see the demand ramp up for that domestically. It didn't happen last year. And the ironic part about last year is that the market rallied during the spring flush, and that's normally <laughs> when it's supposed to go down. So you never know what's going to happen. But yeah, we're, we are hoping and watching for the holiday demand. All right, let's talk about those without milk. Uh, let's talk about the cattle. Uh, that's a market we talk about that it has had a pretty good 2015, but recently yeah. it is not. Why? Um, it is because the animals that are coming to market are heavy production. Even though you know we don't have this herd that is building fast, it's that the weights on these animals that are coming to market are ginormous. And production is actually up 9.6% from a year ago. So quit feeding your cattle so much and <laughs> help the situation. And, and that'll help the supply side of it. But the other part of it too is that we have a lot of um, product that's not moving either. And we have to keep an eye on the choice value. Um, that's a big one going forward. If that continues to fall apart, the cattle price may slide lower. But looking at the Feb cattle futures, uh, uh, buck 25 is probably a, a pretty good support area. So we might go a little lower, but then I think it'll stabilize. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. But again, it's more of a still negative outlook right now just because of the supply short term that we have on hand. 
And it seems silly to put those cows on a diet, but sometimes you have to. <laughs> sometimes, I guess so. To get, this, uh, to, to get some money back. All right, give me a range on feeders. What do you think? Um, looking at 150 on the downside, um, maybe at the upside, kind of like 160, 165. So again, more of a choppy sideways trading range. The market, I think, needs to start to really um, get a handle on, on the supply demand situation and get things more current. Uh, I'm, I don't think it's going to go too much lower for the first quarter, but we don't have a reason to rally yet. Hogs, they always are kind of different than the beef. They go up this week uh, about a dollar and a half. Yeah. Why? Seasonal bounce. Okay. That's why. Um, they, they actually have a, a large production burden also right now. The sow slaughter is down 10%. So what's that saying to the market is that the herd is still growing, and, and actually the slaughter levels overall are 7% higher than a year ago right now. The weights are still huge. But the one thing that the hog market has going for it is that the products have been so cheap, like example, pork loin down 25% in value from a year ago. And with the holidays and ham, we are starting to see the cutouts there and all of the, the pork product, the demand is kicking in. So that along with the seasonal tendency for the market to bounce is why that hog market has been working higher uh, over the past week. So again, any rally here, probably a hedging opportunity for producers because again, the supplies are still big. But I'm just hungry hearing about those pork <laughs> coins. Yeah. And that's what everybody else is, too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, All right Naomi Blue, thank you so very much for joining us this week. Thank you. That will do it uh, for this edition of Market to Market. But Naomi and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions on the Market Plus segment available on our website. It's also where you'll find audio podcasts, streaming video of the program, and also links to those Twitter and Facebook feeds. And join us again next time when we'll examine one cattle buyer's quest to build genetics and herds out west. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Paul Yeager. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.